So good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, my name's Sue Dehenny. I'm the Regional Chief Nurse in the South West, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this talk this afternoon. Um, supporting our Southwest people through menopause. I was going to say NHS, but I understand we might have colleagues that have joined us from non-NHS uh, organisations, which is great. You're all more than welcome. Um, the, the, the purpose of, of today is to really start the conversation. And I recognise that many of you will be having conversations locally within your own trusts and within your own colleagues. Um, and maybe at home as well. But today is to empower you to have those conversations and welcome to the Southwest in order for us to start that. A very well, warm welcome to Kate, Kate Muir, who's an author and also um, done some fantastic work around raising the profile of menopause. I won't say too much because I know Kate will cover that, but you may well um, have heard of Kate. If you haven't, then you'll certainly want to after today. There's an opportunity at the end to ask any questions. Um, so please do use the chat function uh, to raise any questions. Unfortunately, because of the numbers, we might not be able to get through all the questions and provide answers. What we will try and do, though, is group them together so that you get the best opportunity um, at the end to be able to hear both answers to it, but also some of the questions other people have raised. Just like to go through a few of the numbers and why it's so important that we do have these conversations um, and that it's really important as NHS colleagues that we start looking at how we can improve the work life for people that may be going through menopause or experiencing that through colleagues or indeed at home. On average, there's about 400,000 women who start menopause each year. And according to an online survey, there's about 5,000 uh, women that who were surveyed rather, one in three of which are prescribed antidepressants unnecessarily, one in three were not um, correctly diagnosed for at least three years, and the list goes on. We can see that there's more to do, and we're really, really keen in the Southwest to open this up so that we start giving you and your colleagues the best opportunity to deal with symptoms of menopause, but also have that work life that they can actually openly talk about what their symptoms are. There's over 75% of our workforce within the NHS that are women, and women between the ages of 45 and 54 make up a fifth of all NHS employees. That means about 20% 20, 20 of our workforce could be experiencing menopausal symptoms at any time. We also recognise and, and value diversity and trans inclusive culture, and we are trying really hard to make sure we understand what the menopause means for all uh, throughout the NHS. So colleagues, please come forward and help us understand what we can do more within this area. We also know that we need to make sure that we turn any strategy into improvement, and that's why it's great to have Julie Smee as our lead on this in the Southwest, because it's really important that we do see improvement. And it's not just about the NHS People Promise or indeed the new women's health strategy from the government on this, but we turn it into something that's meaningful in the workplace. I'm really pleased to hear that we've got some men who've joined us this afternoon because this is about women, but it's also about the impact that menopause can have. And we recognise that it is as important to educate men around what this may mean for them as colleagues or indeed at home. So please uh, feel welcomed, please ask questions and please join in the conversation. I'm going to hand over to Kate now. Um, please do use the uh, the uh, chat box. Uh, we're really keen to hear. Kate will uh, speak for about half an hour and then we'll have an opportunity to open it up for questions. So Kate, over to you. Thank you and a warm welcome to the Southwest. Hi, thank you very much, Sue. I'm looking forward to this because I've got really, really interested in what's going on with the menopause in the NHS because I've been working up in Derby making a film with NHS workers and a doctor and I was astonished at the stories women told me uh, there. So I am really interested to have this conversation with you guys 
And I have also got a little PowerPoint I'm going to show you about the menopause movement. It's a bit of science because I know you like that and uh, a little bit about what we can do to change things because we are here starting a revolution. Got to make that absolutely clear. Um, so um, I just wanted to tell you for a quick second about my own menopause because it was not just a car crash, but a full Thelma and Louise off the cliff, right? And I, you know, I was actually the film critic at the Times at the time, and I had no idea what was happening to me. I was getting heart palpitations in the night, waking up at four in the morning, thinking I was actually having a cartoon-like heart attack, went for the ECG, they said, you're fine, too much coffee, away you go, and the heart palpitations continued almost every night. And I'm in my late 40s then. In my early 50s, I am remembering 350 films a year as the critic, but I'm suddenly at home writing a shopping list one Saturday, and I find that um, I can't, I'm, I'm writing this list, and I'm thinking I must shave my legs, and I can't remember the word razor. I write down the word shaver on my list because I don't know that word anymore. It takes me 15 minutes to remember the word razor. At that point, I think, because my mum died of Alzheimer's, I've got Alzheimer's, this is the end of the world. I go into complete panic because I, you know, I'm remembering all these names, but I can't remember the name of an ordinary noun in my house. I ring all my friends, and this is like five, six years ago, and they go, oh, we're all on HRT, we've gone on it privately because we couldn't get it from our GPs. And I'm going, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me about memory and HRT? And I just thought, I'm the sort of person, and this is a while ago, so there's much more information now, but I would Google everything. I was looking everything up that was happening to me and I couldn't work out what was going on. And I thought, right, if I can't work out what's going on, and lots of people I talk to are not working out that say, you know, palpitations affect, in the end, it turned out 44% of menopausal women, but nobody was talking about it. So I thought, right, I'm going to make a film. Uh, I'd never made a documentary before. Um, and if you could uh, just start up the PowerPoint now, James, that would be great. Um, so the first thing, I don't know, is that, is that it up now? Yeah. So the, the first thing I did was I, I thought I'd make the film, but as it turned out, lockdown came crashing down just after I got the film commissioned from Channel 4. And they said, we're shutting it down. We're taking all the money back. You can't make the film. So I thought, oh, God. So I wrote a book about the menopause. And while everybody was baking their sourdough bread, I was ringing the experts at Harvard and Yale and the International Menopause Society. And they had nowhere to go because they were stuck in their back bedrooms at the beginning of COVID all across the world. And they answered my questions. So I, instead of making a film a, in a kind of you know rough kind of way, I really dug deep into the science. And that has been completely life changing, I think, for me and has made me want to campaign around the science around menopause. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we ended up, I ended up recruiting Davina McCall, who, as you now know, is the British face of menopause. And we made these two films. Um, and the first film, which came out in 2021, um, in the first night, it got a million viewers. By the Friday after, it had two million viewers. And altogether, the films have had six million viewers together. So we knew that there was a viral thing going on and women were saying to their partners, to their friends, watch this film. This is revealing secrets we don't know. And I think that's true of the whole menopause situation for so long. Um, because there wasn't really a solution to this problem, because we were all terrified of the old HRT and the big headlines around it, none of us wanted to touch it so all of us were pretending this was not happening and just trying to keep calm and carry on as it says on the poster next slide please and uh instead of course now we know we can take action on all fronts and it's not just hrt but breaking the taboo and having conversations like this and you know just shouting which is so cathartic, actually. Uh, anyway, here are three of my great menopause friends now, um, which is uh, Dr. Louise Newson, who uh, set up the menopause charity, and I helped her do that. Um, and she has the biggest uh, menopause clinic in the world, but does 
huge research around menopause and campaigning and it's really interesting on long-term health and menopause. In the middle, Caroline Harris MP, who we love, uh, who has taken all the HRT bills through Parliament and is speaking out about menopause all the time. Fantastic ball of fire. And then the third person is Karen Arthur, who is the creator of the Menopause Whilst Black Instagram and podcast. And she campaigns not just sort of on the medical front, but on the kind of almost a philosophical way and she talks about the kind of really interesting changes you can make in midlife and move forward so she's thinking about a bigger picture too next slide please um, and this is one of the early sort of founders of the menopause movement, which is Diane Danzebrink, who's a great woman. Uh, she's underneath the statue of Millicent Fawcett when we were in Parliament Square holding up the votes for menopausal women sign. <laughs> um, and this is where we are. We have got a little mini suffragette movement going on, I think, around the menopause and we are taking it forward. Um, and, and a lot of the news is quite joyful, but I'm going to show you some of the bad news first. So next slide. Yes, well, you, you know this, but maybe you don't. And not necessarily, men don't necessarily know all this and they're, they're sitting, their partners, their sisters, their friends, their colleagues are all going through it. And there's a lot of really weird symptoms around menopause. I mean, it, it's, it is a spooky part of a woman's life. And just like I didn't know about my heart palpitations, so many women just think, oh, hot flashes, you know, my periods will get a bit irregular, um, but they don't know about things like, vaginal dryness. Massive. 80% of us get it eventually. It's the whole vulva. It can affect your urinary tract infections. It really, really matters. And there are lots of solutions. Then I got this weird thing, um, which is a feeling at night that there are little ants crawling up your legs on your shin bones. And apparently that was to do with lack of oestrogen. And the minute I went on HRT, well, two days later, it went away. But I just thought, why, you know, why are the things crawling up my legs at night? And it's that feeling when the collagen changes and the estrogen isn't feeding your skin and your skin's dry and it can happen all over your body. And, you know, we do not talk about it and we don't talk about loss of libido and we don't talk about what I call menopause's dastardly little sister, perimenopause enough, because that is where the really evil work is done, I think, by menopause, which is your, your hormones are literally going up and down like that. The oestrogen is in these mad waves, sometimes higher than normal, sometimes way down low. And the progesterone is going slowly down and that calming progesterone is disappearing in your late 40s or earlier. Um, and, you know, there's enormous anxiety that occurs among women at that time, often in the middle of the night, and they get really sleepless. Next slide, please. So you've got all that going on, obviously, and people are keeping quiet about it. They don't know what their symptoms are. They don't know why they're getting these things. And we did this huge survey for the second Davina McCall menopause programme, which I produced, and one in 10 women in Britain are leaving their jobs due to menopause. And that was a survey of 4,000 women all around the country, diverse women, a really proper inclusive professional survey. It wasn't just a menopausal women on Instagram, it was the world. And that is really shocking because that is a sort of silent decimation of our working population. And as you know, these women are experienced, they're smart, their children might have been grown up, they are perfect to be doing jobs to the full extent and looking after other people. And yet it is at this very moment that they drop quietly out of the workplace. And we found that 14% were going part-time, 14% reducing their hours, and 8% had refused promotion. What's happening? You know, that that this is wrong, right? And we need to do something about it and we can do something about it. Next slide. And one of the things that terror this is me stupidly towing this sign round King's Cross for the, the TV crew when we were filming. Anyway, um, one of the really key things is that brain fog and memory problems really, really matter. And seven out of 10 women struggle with brain fog in menopause. And that came out in our poll. And I was really surprised by the high level of that. And it is what it is, it's really frightening. Just like it was frightening for me not remembering the word razor. Um, I was talking to a doctor the other day and she said, I've been prescribing this prescription for 20 years. 
but I couldn't remember what it was called yesterday. I was thinking, get the HRT now. Um, but literally, she, she was about to put herself out of the job because she was so scared of the risks that she might be taking. You know, we can't all sit at home with a little fan and do our gardening. We are working until we're 67, 68. And we are responsible people doing responsible jobs. And if you've got brain fog, you know, you really think, oh, my God, this, this is a risk not just to me, but to other people. So it's really serious that we think about ways of dealing with this. And next slide, please. So this great big poll, one, one of the things I found when, when I was writing this poll and writing the questions is when I was doing the book, I, I couldn't find lots of information. I would think, well, what percentage are struggling with anxiety and depression together? And what percentage, you know, are struggling with sleeplessness? And of course, nobody much had bothered to ask those questions because they weren't really medical questions, were they? They were just like people getting on with it questions. And when I when I did this and the answers came back, I was just sort of astonished. 73% brain fog, 84% struggling with sleeplessness and exhaustion. And 69% said they had depression and anxiety. A caveat to that, it, we did it just after we, we'd come out of COVID. So I think everybody had anxiety and depression. Still, lots of women have anxiety and depression in menopause. And we know that, as you mentioned earlier, Sue, about the prescriptions of antidepressants to, to people. And one of the other things was that in, in that poll, we discovered that 40, I think it was 41 or 44 percent, I can't remember which, um, had enormous periods in perimenopause, tsunami periods. You know, I always think two Tampax to go on the tube. That's the way I thought about it. And when women are at work and particularly in 12 hour shift situations, the idea that you nipped the loo because you've had a flooding period and you don't know when it's coming because they're completely unpredictable because your hormones are doing that in perimenopause. That's a key point about being kind to people. And we don't necessarily need menopause leave or menopause policies. You just need to think, wait a minute, that woman is, you know, has said she might be menopausal or that non-binary person. And we need to just give her the space to go to the bathroom for 10 minutes and not make a comment about it and be helpful. And, you know, it, I've like things like on the Amazon fulfillment line, if you're away for more than five minutes from your post, you get kind of a black mark. And, you know, women who are dealing with something as simple as a big period, you know, really, really need a bit of kindness, a bit of help, a bit of space. And, you know, people have got to think about that kind of thing. Next slide, please. Anyway, we have spoken of the horrors and now we speak of the joy. Um, so this is body identical HRT. Now, it is very different from the older forms of HRT. Um, and I'll just tell you what's in the picture. So that this is um, the, the, the pump gel is Easter gel and it could be uh, a gel or a spray or a patch, little blue patch, little blue boxes of patches are the same thing. And it's transdermal estrogen goes directly into your skin, doesn't go through your liver, doesn't go through your stomach. And it's much safer for clots. It's not got that risk of clots that the old HRT had. It's much safer for breast cancer. And generally, it's better tolerated by women. And also with the gel, because guess what? No women's hormones are exactly the same. So you can put one pump of the gel or two pumps or three pumps and work out if your hot flushes are poking through, you know, do you need more or less? Like I started on two pumps, still got some hot flushes, went to three, three pumps a day. I don't get hot flushes. So I know that's just the right amount for me, but it might be different from my neighbour up the road. Um, the other thing here is eutrogestan, which is the progesterone pill, which you take at night and it protects the lining of your womb when you're taking estrogen. You need the two together. And it's also very calming at night. So you crash out, you feel relaxed um, and it's a very, very good time to take it. Naturally, there are UK wide shortages at the moment of eutrogestan because women have changed over to these new prescriptions because they're safer and better tolerated. And we are waiting for a huge delivery to come in. So women are really struggling right now without that and having to go back on some of the older forms of HRT. The pink tube in the middle, which I'll tell you about later, is Androfem, which is actually the licensed Australian testosterone for women, the only one in the world licensed for women, but you can get it here. And I will talk more about testosterone later. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, so one of the things, and I really want to talk about this, is um, 
the, the studies on HRT are, I think, shockingly, shockingly covered by the media and not really understood by a huge part of the scientific community and not possibly understood in their latest form by even your local GP. And what happened was over 20 years ago, there was this huge study in America called the Women's Health Initiative. It was 16,000 women and they were given very high doses of the very old kind of HRT, which was a synthetic progestin and an estrogen which was extracted from pregnant mayor's urine. So horse piss, synthetic progestin, large dose. They gave it to a bunch of women who did not have hot flushes. That was one of the key things. They wouldn't let them in the trial unless they didn't have hot flushes. So the average age of the women they tested out those high dose of HRT on was 63. And already many of them, the majority of them were either obese or overweight. Some had been smokers. Obviously, their oestrogen receptors had shut down by the time they were 63. They were given high dose oestrogen, which had a risky clotting agent in it as well. They were hoping to show that oestrogen helped heart health in this study. Instead, they got a slight increased raise of breast cancer and some heart risk as well. Now, if you think about the science in that study, it, ask a 12 year old about that study. It's screamingly wrong and it's not really aimed at menopausal women. There are useful things we've learned from that study, which was that people who were on oestrogen alone actually had a lower rate of breast cancer over 18 years and had a longer lifespan. But the people who were on this old combined pill, it was not good. Um, and what we've learned now is that the body identical oestrogen, which is extracted from soy, which is an exact copy of your own hormone, is completely different. Has anyone done a study of 16,000 women, a randomised control trial? No, they haven't, because they're not going to make any money out of it, because hormones are products of nature and big pharma really can't patent them. So, you know, that 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 oestrogel I was showing you costs four pounds to the NHS a month and the progesterone costs five pounds. So they're, they're not going to make these thousands and thousands of pounds on, you know, repackaging those two drugs. So nobody's going to bother doing the tests except for kind of academics. Um, and this was really interesting. There was a paper uh, where they looked at the UK data link and they looked at 430,000 women uh, who are uh, in it and who had not had breast cancer and 43,000 who had breast cancer and they looked at their HRT use and when you crunch into the paper you find that the people who were on body identical oestrogen and progesterone did not have an increased risk of breast cancer. Now that's an observational study, it's all we've got apart from a few French studies but you know I'd rather go with that than the flawed American study. And I'm just going into that detail for you because you are medical professionals and you know you, you know about reading studies and trusting them and not trusting them. And we've trusted the wrong study for a very long time and people are still using it all the time. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, and I'm sure many of you know, but you know, you we had a woman in, in, in the film we, we made who had menopause at 14. I've got a friend who had menopause at 26. When you're looking for a menopausal woman in your workplace, she might be, you know, under 30. And it's very, very hard to talk about that. And you don't necessarily want to turn up to your menopause cafe at work. You're not in that 50 something group who are moaning together in some corner. You are on your own and you're weird compared to your your, your friends who are all on the pill. And it's, it's, you know, it's really, really difficult. It's very hard. And one of the things that women can do uh, if they're at that stage, and obviously, get some help if your periods have stopped and also uh, go to the DAISY network which is very very good it has groups it has online meetings it has a conference and they deal with premature ovarian insufficiency uh, which is the other word for early menopause and really worth reaching out to your community if you're in that position because so much and also so many women get menopause in their early 40s and perimenopause it's absolutely not timed at 51, like it says in the textbooks. And I was really interested, I was reading a paper from India the other day and it said the average age of menopause is 46 in India. So 
What about our South Asian community here? Has anyone bothered to study? No, we don't know. And for black women, it's probably a year earlier and they get much worse hot flushes, according to African-American studies in America. We haven't done them here. Again, you know, it really makes me angry, the sort of misogyny and racism of, of, in the science around this. And we really need to shout out about that too. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so this is this is for you guys at work. And obviously, I think you're probably across all this already. You're already educating by the fact we're here. I was noticing when I was in the Royal Derby that people were still wearing awful uniforms that didn't have any zips or buttons. And they were kind of nylony and they had to pull them over their heads. And they were just not good if you were having a hot flush. And obviously, you can deal with your hot flush with HRT, but not everybody can. And people who are in perimenopause haven't quite worked out what's going, but they're, they're wearing, you know, this difficult uniform. So it's really nice to, to think about that. And again, what I mentioned about heavy periods, give people a break. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, hot flushes, temperature, it can be really hard to deal with these things. Um, and, and interestingly, and this is this is quite critical of the NHS at this point, but the NHS put a, a paper to its line managers and colleagues, a 25 page menopause policy paper advising what they should do. Uh, and it, it, for a start, it didn't mention HRT one single time in those 25 pages, which I thought was extraordinary. It did offer resources to go to, uh, like the British Menopause Society and the NHS website, but it did not mention HRT. It did mention you can work it from home. And I think for many, many NHS workers, that is not an option, you know. And really what I found talking to those women in Derby the other day, and I interviewed lots of women, was that doing 12 hour shifts are not places where you're gonna you know, be sitting in front of a little fan and you know, chilling out. You are at the toughest end of, of, of working life. And for those women who can tolerate and want HRT, and you know, it has these profoundly beneficial effects in terms of longevity of life, in terms of having sore joints, it really makes your joints nice and rubbery. Um, you know, it has these great benefits. And for those who can tolerate it, why live with the symptoms? So I think that's a very important message to get out. And people are really afraid of the medical message. And I think, you know, here's a medical organisation putting out a 25 page document that doesn't mention HRT and doesn't mention there are different kinds of HRT. It's got a lot better. There are safe ways of doing it. You, you could consult. I mean, I've just felt they're missing a trick here because in my experience of having met workers on the ground, they need really, really solid help and not just a policy. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Now this bit I like, I, I like, this was the bits I was doing in lockdown. Um, there's a great book by uh, Dr. Lisa Moscone, who is at the Weill Cornell Brain Institute in America. Um, and she's written a book called The XX Brain, which is all about what oestrogen, which of course is one of our hormones that disappears in, in menopause, you know, oestrogen, progesterone go down and testosterone goes down too, but oestrogen and progesterone disappear really. So when oestrogen goes in your brain, it really changes it. And this is a brain scan of a normal woman, uh, age 43 at the left hand side, and you can see she's firing on all cylinders. And that's her 10 years later. And you can see the brain is working working differently. Uh, next slide, please. And this is very technical, but it's really interesting. So this is what happened. she studied all these slides of women like that and worked out what fuel their brain was running on in premenopause and postmenopause. And basically, unless you're on HRT, which changes this story altogether, your brain works on different fuel premenopause postmenopause. Nobody explains that our brain completely changes. It changes in adolescence. If you get pregnant, it changes then and it changes a third time in menopause. And it's those brain changes that are leaving women struggling and walking out of their jobs and they don't realise there's going to be another side that they can come through it or they can take HRT. And what this shows, if you look at the pink line at the bottom, it says cerebral glucose mechanism. Now you need oestrogen to get that to work. And when the oestrogen disappears, your brain is no longer running on that as its fuel. And instead it starts pumping, you'll see the blue line cerebral blood flow goes up it's working on blood, it's working on blood flow instead. So it's really changed from petrol 
to diesel or something. Um, and, and we don't recognize that that chaos in the middle where those lines are going up and down and the gray matter is going up, going down and then up, the white matter is going down. You know, your brain is working in completely different ways. Yet we just say, oh, menopause transition, you'll be fine. And no, we've got to recognize that this is a major, our brains are spaghetti junction at this point. And, and, and mine was. And, you know, also you, you're seeing it from the inside. So you think you're normal and the way you're behaving is normal and things are and, it, you know, it really is you uh, often causing the chaos. <laughs> I certainly found that. Um, and the other thing which you probably don't want to know, but it's, it's quite important to, to point out, and I'm increasingly interested in the long term effect of estrogen in the brain. That red line there is amyloid plaque deposition, and that is a precursor sometimes to Alzheimer's which my mum died of. And I was always terrified that there wasn't going to be any answer for me to be dealing with my genetic inheritance of Alzheimer's. And in fact, it turns out um, that uh, there's been a really big study of 400,000 women by Dr. Roberta Brinton in Arizona. And she has discovered that women who were on transdermal HRT, like the, the body identical kind I showed you, were 73% less likely to get Alzheimer's than those who were not on any HRT at all. And other kinds of HRT helps a bit. Uh, again, nobody's done the 20 year study on Alzheimer's because science, you know. Uh, but it is really interesting for those of us who carry the Alzheimer's gene to think about going on HRT as early as we can, if we can, because it is quite clear that oestrogen has these profound effects on the brain and, of course, the rest of the body. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to zip through that. I've just said that. Next slide. Now, yeah, so this is really important. If you're going to thrive at work, you've got to thrive at home. And I was working for the menopause charity and we had no money whatsoever. So I had to write the, the motorway poster for the M6. So I wrote, lost your sex drive. 51% of women say menopause affects their relationship. And it does. And two things happen. Next slide, please. There's a, basically our testosterone is going steadily down and we've got about half the amount we had when we were 18, once we were about 50. And some women had none. I had none at all. Can 50, it just had disappeared for me. Um, and I take testosterone as well as estrogen and progesterone, HRT, and it really makes a big difference to me. But under the NICE guidelines, you can ask for testosterone to be prescribed on top of your normal HRT if you've got low libido. And for many, many women, that is the case. And a lot of relationships break up between the divorce peaks between 45 and 50. Um, and the other problem, uh, next slide, please. Uh, is vaginal dryness and women find it agony to have sex, some of them. Um, the, the whole vagina, vagina vulva area has gone dry. You think about the amount of money we spend on Chanel for our faces age 50 and we're getting wrinkly and dry. We do nothing about down there and we should be looking after our vulvas. And vaginal oestrogen is safe for almost everybody. It's even given to people who have had breast cancer. So it is, uh, and it basically brings back the moisture to your vagina and it elasticates the tissue. And it really, really helps with urinary tract infections because it helps your urethra too. Um, and so those women running to the loo every hour suddenly find once they're on vaginal oestrogen for a few weeks and it takes a while, and it's just like a little pessary or a little um, bit of gel or whatever, a cream, and it has a really profound effect. Um, and I always think about, I was thinking about my mum in, in a care home in her end of years, and you know, all those women sitting in agony and they, they've got, you know, terrible urinary problems. And I wonder, should we be giving all of them vaginal oestrogen too? Would it make a difference at that stage? Quite probably it would, but nobody is talking about these things. And we really need to, you know, upgrade our thinking around women's health in all those areas. Next slide, please. Now, this is one. Now, we are slightly disagreeing here, Sue, on the number of NHS workers who are women of perimenopausal or menopausal age. But I looked at the surveys and that's the over 45s and on. But anyway, we know a lot of the NHS workers are women and a lot are over 45. Um, I know that's the nurse vacancies from 2022, but I think there's 120,000 vacancies in the NHS just now. But 
anyway, we also know there's a lot of that. Um, I was I was talking to the RCN about it, and they said, oh, 30 percent of nurses resigned due to stress, mental health or workplace culture. Nobody asked them about menopause. But I think for that group, there's another story that yet again, we don't know. Anyway, we crunched the figures and we crunched the figures with I got, I got someone who can do maths to do this for me um, and the balance app helped me as well uh, so we crunched the figures and we worked out doctor salaries nurses salaries training at the cost of the average nhs worker the cost of recruitment and we worked out if those one in ten women who who leave their jobs i mean this is imaginary stayed the savings in retraining those doctors those nurses those who are healthcare professionals of all kinds would be 700 million so that is my prize I offer to you in the NHS. It's a, it's, it's a wild formula, right? But there's a huge truth in, in what you could do with that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, now, this is a bit more about inclusion and diversity. And this is my friend, Dr. Niga Tarif, who's in the little uh, film I've made about the NHS in Derby too. Um, what is brilliant about her is she's on morning telly, she's on TikTok, she's got this huge account, Dr. Nigata Reef on TikTok, and I mean, she's the best social media operator I've ever met, actually. And uh, she does these fantastic um, TikToks in Urdu and Punjabi, uh, and you hear her going, blah, 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 vaginal estrogen, blah, 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 because th there aren't words for some of these things in Urdu. And these kids who are following her on TikTok take it to their mums. And this is a way, you know, this is just another way into that community that is not having that conversation. And by just putting it up there, um, she is just fantastic. I love her. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. And again, this is queermenopause.com. Um, it's worth looking at as a resource. It's a website. Unfortunately, they are so under-resourced and there is so little information about what happens to trans men. And of course, it's different depending on whether they've had operations or how much testosterone. And it's so different what, what happens to non-binary people. But we know it's a struggle and there, there are communities here. And, and I think there are probably other communities online. But again, because menopause is such a triggering thing for a lot of people, it's not so openly discussed because, you know, you're a trans man in menopause. You don't want to talk about it. But I was doing a, a talk at Liverpool University the other day online. And, you know, there were a couple of men at the back of the room and then one of them sent me an email afterwards and said, I, I was a man at the back of the room, but I'm actually getting hot flushes. And, you know, I, I you know, transitioned and everything, but I'm still getting the hot flushes. I'm using testosterone and I was so glad to hear that I can have this conversation and I can find out more about mixing my hormones up and what I can do. And you, you just don't know who it is. So you, you've got to kind of just open up that space and I wish there was more research, but it's a real struggle. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just saying this at the end, because we're about to go into questions, but this is indeed my, my mate, Karen Arthur, who um, I have to say this is, you know, we're talking about change and going forward. And, you know, you can do great things with this period in your life, because once your hormones are at a level, as mine are, you know, you were a clapped out banger, but now you're a Tesla, because you get up, your hormones are the same every morning, and you're like, I can do this and you have massive energy. I mean, it really has made a difference to a lot of us. And I, I will also talk later about, you know, if you can't take HRC before before I finish, but I just want to talk about Karen. She was a teacher and uh, the alarm bell went off one day. She was in the middle of hot flush. She was feeling depressed. She took her, took her bag, walked out, never went back to her job, signed off, depression, everything. Got sorted, got therapy calmed down, eventually after a while got onto HRT and then decided she was basically going to be the queen of menopause. And she also became a fashion designer. And this is her in Catford Town Hall, where she has a studio in the old Catford Town Hall, does these amazing wedding costumes. They're just fantastic. And she has just come out and she's holding menopause retreats. And she's just, you know, has this vital life to her. And I think she's such an example to us all that you can just take this and run with it and do amazing things. Um, so, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. We aren't getting old and we can do something. The other thing I just wanted to mention is for so many women, it's one in seven get breast cancer and only some of those can take HRT and many don't want to. There are many other solutions and there is a brilliant booklet on um, the, the Balance uh, Menopause website 
which is about menopause after breast cancer. And, you know, I, I've also got two friends for my book. We had a bit of fun doing alternatives. I've got two friends with breast cancer who are out the other side. And we tested really high grade CBD oil on them. And one of them's hot flushes calmed down and the other one slept better. And obviously you've got to look after your bones, etc. after breast cancer. You've got to make sure you're doing weight bearing exercise. There's a whole other story there uh, of what you can do. And there are some low dose antidepressants that also help with um, hot flushes. But really, you know, the thing to do and, and for all of us at this stage in our lives is uh, you can reduce your rate of the recurrence of breast cancer by 50 percent if you do 20 minutes exercise every day. And that's a huge scientific study of the whole of America. I always say that to people who are feeling a bit hopeless. Exercise is the thing and it's the thing for all of us. Uh, next slide, I think we're nearly done. Yeah, oh yeah, next slide after that, because this is the woman and this is my recommendation. Get on the Balance app. It is absolutely brilliant. About a million women have downloaded it. It is the best menopause app available. It's got treatment options for HRT, alternatives to HRT. Everything is science based. There is there is no rubbish in there and they're not going to sell you, you know, marigold flower cream. It is absolutely free and it doesn't have any adverts. Um, so it is really worth and you can log your periods and everything. So Balance app is where I would go for information and we can stop it there. We can stop the PowerPoint there. <laughs> And I'll take some questions. Thank you, Kate. Um, gosh, we never stop learning. I've learned so much and I thought I knew quite a bit as a as a uh, somebody who has been through menopause. So, Kate, thank you. Thank you for your openness and, and honesty as well. Um, lots and lots of questions, some quite individual, but there are some uh, general questions. Julie, I don't know whether you've been able to sort of group some of those together and we can maybe talk through those. That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. So, yeah, I'd be delighted to do so. And Kate, wow, um, you'll not have a chance to see the comments and the questions in the <laughs> chat, but it's astounding. Um, so thank you everyone for your contribution. It feels like it's a, a good safe space for people to share and to support each other. So there's lots of different ways we can go with the conversation. I think I'm going to start with perimenopause because there's that so that for me, um, my own menopause journey was slightly serendipity. You know, it just happened to be through some research that I did that I discovered the symptoms I had was actually related to menopause. Um, but we need to talk more about the perimenopause, the build up to that. So especially when we're thinking about in the workplace, um, do you think there's opportunity for us to do more around awareness around me perimenopause, Kate? Oh, well, we welcome your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's the key because women know they're in menopause, don't they? It's quite clear your periods are gone. But it's that point when you don't know what's happening to you. And that is when relationships break up, break out. You know, I mean, I have to say a quick personal perimenopause moment is I will tell you the things I threw at the kitchen wall in perimenopause. I'm not an angry woman normally, but I threw blue paint, broccoli, a butter dish that broke with all the bits of butter in the butter dish, a butternut squash, heavy, and a copy of Nigella Christmas at the wall. And obviously my, my three children, my husband, they were all much nicer to me after that. And I had expressed my anger safely. But I mean, I never do things like that. That is not me. And I was possessed by a perimenopausal rage, which a lot of women get. And they find they have an almost out of body experience in all sorts of ways. They burst into tears. You know, your emotions are not in control. And, and you know, the minute I was on HRT, absolutely fine, absolutely, you know, normal. The only people I'm angry at are the people not paying attention to menopause. But, you know, apart from that, um, I'm a very calm person. Uh, but I really think, yes, we do strange things and we don't know why. And it is like being possessed. And, you know, you also as a woman, you know, your hormones are doing, you know, your monthly thing. But here they're doing something whoa, way out of normal. And I think we need to really, every time we mention the word perimenopause, say perimenopause too. And I know that the word only appeared properly on the NHS website about a year ago. And it's a key thing to talk about. Yeah, I think you're so right. Yeah. 
I mean, that leads me into thinking about education. Some of the comments that have come through are around the role um, of better education for clinical staff, but also uh, there was a comment about um, should we start this in schools? Should we be having this conversation about changes to to us females um, through a life course? We talk a lot about puberty, don't we, at schools, but maybe less so in the older age. Um, what do you know? Uh, what's your thoughts around that? Um, is there any good examples of work going on around that area? What's, it got put on the RSE curriculum about a year ago, but it's like a tiny paragraph. Uh, I think it should be taught in biology a bit more. A lot of the time it's just not, it just misses out. People think people have periods forever. Um, the other thing is until 2024, it is not going to be an official module in medical schools, but we're looking forward to that. Uh, the other thing healthcare professionals can do is there is a brilliant confidence in the menopause course, which is free online via the menopause charity and 14 fish. And I think 30,000 or 40,000 people have done it and it's six hours and it also does HRT prescribing, but it does the whole menopause. And if you've got a missing link in your knowledge, then you know you don't have to, to be a doctor but it's just really useful to know and i always think everybody in the nhs is going to meet all these people and say to them oh you've got a hot flush today that's what i did you know for every nhs person that learns about the menopause there's probably 10 20 that they meet that they pass on the information in the way lots of the rest of us do not and i i think you know every piece of education kind of expands it's it's really worth it <laughs> I think just on that, Julie, there's um, there's quite a few questions or comments about GPs not taking uh, people seriously um, mm -hmm. or misprescribing or uh, indeed um, dismissing people's suggestion of what may make life interesting. I'm wondering whether as a commitment from the Southwest, we write out to all GPs um, with those links to uh, to that education, uh, because I think we have to take action. It's not necessarily uh, intentional, it's often ignorance. Um, and therefore, if we try the best we can do by providing the resources that are available, even if we hit one in 10, that will be 10 yeah. less people that will be struggling. So so let's make that a commitment, Julie, and we'll get those uh, resources out to people. Oh, that was wonderful, Sue. I, I'm totally behind you and agree. Um, I'd like to go to a conversation about men next, Kate, if that's all right. And I've got a couple of comments that gather quite a lot of likes um, from both perspectives. So I'll go one way and then we'll go the other. So one's come from wom a woman talking about how can she um, help her husband? How can her husband be more supportive? You know, he's sort of how can we help our men in our life to understand truly what this is about and okay. um, become more supportive so that we can have that support we need to manage to manage that process of menopause? It's really difficult, isn't it? Because that conversation is, is difficult. I mean, quite a few people have said to me, I sat down with my husband or partner and I watched your documentaries because they're still on more forum mm. and forever. And that's an easy way of sitting in front of something in silence and then going, well, I've got a bit of that, you know. Um, I, otherwise, you've just got to you've just got to bring it right out there and make it part of. Uh, it's hard though, isn't it? But um, you know, you've got to think about it. What if men got menopause, <laughs> and, and and what they would be saying and shouting about? And I think one of the ways you can talk about it is to say men's testosterone goes down. Um, quite a lot after the age of 50 and they too some of them have real hormonal dips and I think it's about five percent are actually so low that they, they, they ought to have their testosterone topped up and they get exactly the same symptoms as we do they're exhausted they're they're, they're, they're tired they get brain fog the muscle development isn't as good the, the bones are affected by it it's exactly the same when we've lost our estrogen and men lose their testosterone same thing happens and by the time you're 80 you are at the equivalent age to a menopausal woman at 50 with her lack of hormones. But if you can talk about men and women together and that we all lose our hormones and that certainly some men who are very, very low really should get their testosterone tested if they're showing um, those symptoms because it can really help with stuff like diabetes and all sorts of stuff. So maybe it's all our hormones because we've all got to work so much longer than we had and it would be better that we all functioned. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, 
it's talking about it's important it's just how to do that i guess sometimes it can be quite tricky but but on saying that we did have one um comment from a gentleman who said well, you know i i want to help promote the message to other men is there a way that men in the nhs can help push that message out it's such an important subject that we should be aware of um gosh yes. you can answer that better than me i think um, <laughs> I, think, I, I think your your link in there kate was fantastic i mean you know men have just started talking about erectile dysfunction and we've started to see adverts coming on i don't know whether you noticed but during the european football um, there started to be adverts about erectile dysfunction. I think we've got to use every opportunity about, as you said, Kate, you know, different periods of our life where things start going wrong or right or whatever it may be. Let's open the conversation about it's not just men, it's women, it's not just women, it's men. Because I think if we polarise it into this is a women's issue or a men's issue, we lose the potential levers to get in and have an open and transparent conversation. So I think there's something about, you know, whatever your personal situation is, you will know how to get into those conversations. But often talking about what might be affecting them, not you, is a good way in. And I think erectile yeah. dysfunction is something we start hearing about more now. We start talking about it more now. How can we piggyback on the back of that and say, well, you know, vag vaginal dryness is something that affects women erectile dysfunction how can we have that open conversation and many relationships won't have even gone anywhere near that so how do we make sure that we're having that openness at every level i think is is a great way i think we also need to make sure we continue and it's great to have men on this call today and thank you for those who've joined we need to spread the word you know we have millions of people where yes we're an anchor institution and we need to make sure we're leading the way and having the conversations opening it up and making sure that you're holding us to account to deliver on some of these strategies so that we can have these conversations i think you're right kate confidence can we go to confidence next um so there was lots of comments um and lots of likes for that kind of how it shows up at work you know we're in the perimenopause menopause space and actually it's complete and utter loss of confidence especially you know at the minute there's lots of changes going across the nhs organizations and it just feels quite um you know it, it exacerbates our anxiety and how we feel about work what what kind of things can we do around that other than the lovely <laughs> hrt <laughs> exercise what's I, your I, thoughts I, I, I think talking and I, I really noticed when, when we were doing the, 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 the Derby Hospital thing, we had the first live meeting of the Menopause Cafe for the film because it had been on Zoom because of you know COVID and all these other things. And we had these 20 or 30 women in the room and we just went round and we did your favourite weird symptom. And we had, you know, itchy legs and madness and husband killing and you know, all these different symptoms. Um, and and everybody laughed and people would go, oh, I have pal palpitations too. I have this too. And that open conversation, and we actually had one guy in there as well, that and some younger women, and that open conversation and people laughing and sharing because nobody is a cookie cutter menopause and everybody is really different. And if you can say, oh my God, I couldn't remember my dog's name everybody laughs and then you think well that's okay because I can remember you know how to get to work and I can remember all these other things so you know is and my brain will come back one way or the other you know but I think that I think the support of our colleagues and just being embarrassingly open about everything is fantastic and quite joyful I think you know it, it really is and and I think menopause cafes are fantastic uh, and menopause pubs are also good just saying. Big, I'm busy scribbling down cafe and pubs idea. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the things that you said in, in your talk was about being kind to people. And I think that's really important, isn't it? Especially in the workplace, lots of changes going on. We sometimes can make judgments and uh, um, about what's going on for people. We don't really know um, without talking to them. So that kind of mantra of being kind to one another. Um, is really important and spread that kind of love around. I, I, uh, think, I just want to add that point. Occupational health really needs to think about menopause all the time. Different ages of women. Just just think about it. I was talking to a nurse yesterday 
Um, and she had, because of the HRT shortages, she didn't have, she got herself sorted out, didn't have HRT for four months. And during that four months, she ended up being sent home because she got upset with someone and was being managed and all this. And that didn't come up as like, they've taken away her lifeline for four months. And during those four months, that's when, you know, her manager had difficulty with her and she had difficulty with her manager. She's absolutely fine now. And, you know, the idea that, that nobody's taking that into account is incredibly important, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's work to be done, but it's great that we're starting to have these conversations. I've got a question, which is um, possibly a myth busting one. Is HRT all uh, vegan friendly and cruelty free now? Um, someone were recalling seeing articles a, a while back saying that there was cruel treatment of horses to extract hormones. Uh, well, yeah, and those, that's the HRT you do not want that involves the horses. That's the old stuff, the pregnant mares you're in, the Premarin. Don't go and get that. In fact, it's barely used in Britain nowadays. You want transdermal oestrogen, which is made from soy or yams. So that is, that's vegan friendly. The gel is vegan friendly. Uh, the only thing is the coating on the progesterone pill is, I think, got something in it that Often there is coating on pills that's not vegan friendly. I, I wouldn't know what it was, uh, but you can get a pessary for your progest progesterone, which is vegan friendly called Cyclogest, or you could get a Marina coil or something instead. Um, so there are ways around it, but the basic stuff we are getting is from yams and soy. So that's quite nice. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, we're getting quite close to the end. There was, um, a I just wanted to ask you about other things other than HRT that can help through the process of peri and menopause. You've mentioned exercise. Is there other things, natural things that we can do to help ourselves? Um, I think meditation and that, that mindfulness is really helpful with that sort of midnight 4am anxiety, which a lot of women suffer. I also think, you know, write in a journal of what's happening to you so you can recognise I was crazy that morning, you know, and, and you begin to see the patterns and you see the patterns of your periods and things like that. And that 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 really helps. There's a good study in Wales of women who were post breast cancer getting lots of hot flushes and they did cognitive behavioural therapy, whereas every time the hot flush turned up, they were going, I'm handling this, I'm staying calm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And this is what triggers my hot flushes, etc. And getting rid of sort of some kinds of alcohol, red wine, coffee, stress, you know, all that sends your hot flushes right off the roof. So that CBT trial in Wales with the women really brought down their hot flushes by about 40%. It didn't get rid of them, but it was something. And there are some new medicines which are being trialed, neurokinin B receptor medicines that are, uh, are supposed to help with hot flushes. And if you can get rid of them, then you can sleep and that makes a big difference, you know. Yeah. I agree. Sleep is very important for our bodies. So final question um, for me was just around, well, just activating our voices. So we're beginning to have a conversation. Today's been absolutely fantastic about raising awareness. But what next? What else can we do to um, activate our voices around menopause and keep it on the agenda? Well, I think the cafe thing is massive. I think mm. social media is massive and uh, really Instagram is brilliant on menopause. There are lots of really great accounts to follow. Twitter is great, but Instagram is particularly good because it's more lifestyle-y and, 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 and you can follow people like Nigata Reef and Menopause Whilst Black and indeed me, I am Menno Scandal. Uh, so you can follow that and I always have the latest news. But there are lots and lots of people doing that and I think that's a way forward, but also reading the books, um, you know, going to talks, you know, and just keep bringing people in to talk, I think is very important, you know, bring in, bring in a great menopause doctor to talk, talk, talk you through, you know, your local, you know, in, and a lot of surgeries are doing this where they're getting one menopause doctor who's an expert in at night and they're inviting all the women in their area to come in and, and you know, and then you knock off 100 patients at once as well. <laughs> you know? and, and, and it's the same questions they're asking. So it, it really makes a difference. It's a really good comment there, Julie, from somebody who says it's really important that we talk to our sons about menopause. And I think this is, you know, it is the sons are the, are, are the a product of their mothers, aren't they? And I think it's all our responsibilities to make sure all the males in our families at least know, as well as our colleagues. Um, Julie, I think we're going to have to unfortunately bring this to a close. Kate, can I thank you 
Um, it, it's been a fantastic session and I hope you will get an opportunity to see some of the comments. Thank you everybody who's joined us. Um, this is just the start, as I said at the beginning. Julie, thank you for all your dedication to this across the Southwest. Um, this is a network that I feel, you know, we need a pub, we need a cafe in every corner. Um, and I'm more than happy to come around with you, Julie, setting those up because I think that would be quite an experience for us as well. So uh, thank you, Kate, thank you for your time. Thank you for everybody who's joined us. Hopefully that's been helpful. We will get out more and more links as they become available and we'll make sure through newsletters we keep people informed of what we're doing. Really important part. And Kate, thank you for your work uh, both now and ongoing. I know it will continue. Thank you and goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Bye.